So hello. Um, this is going to be something a little bit different t- to normal. Um, I just finished Money in the Bank, and I thought this would be the best time, better time than any, to go over the um, the sort of video where I go over like how I do all my booking and shit, because a lot of people have asked for it. So here it is, just how I run everything. I've got my spreadsheet open. I've got an agenda of things I want to go over here. And yeah, so I've still got the money in the bank graphics. Um, I haven't edited all the um, champions and shit on it, so they're not spoilers. I don't know if this is going up before money in the bank or not. It may do, but also I may have to go over the championships, so it may not. But yeah, it's just a brief little summary of how I sort of book my shows and how I arrange my roster and how I keep track of everything. So. Yeah, I don't know where to start. I've got spreadsheet in down first, and I'll get my spreadsheet up now. This is basically what I use to do my all my booking on. It is the a um spreadsheet I've made, 2020 challenge run, and what I've done. I've got a raw on a SmackDown page, and yeah, so basically I'll just take the we'll go we'll do the raw roster first. We'll just sort it by raw because. We just do we'll just mess with raw for the time being. So we've got my raw roster here. Um, these are the raw males. Oh, they're the raw males. These are the raw females. And yeah, so I just take a note of them. And what I will do is originally to start with, let's say I was doing it from the start, I write like AJ Styles or put AJ Styles for example. Like I write all the names down like this, and then once I've got everyone on the roster. I'd filter them by faces and heels, so I've got like, yeah, as I've done it already over here, F- faces and heels, I've got all my faces, I actually might rearrange this right now to be fair because, yeah, it, it's not, cr- com- it hasn't held up perfectly in the last two months, so I have all my order of my faces, I'd have had Garza, Bronson Reed, Drew McIntyre, Buddy Murphy, Daniel Bryan in like alphabetical order when I went for the roster. And then how I sort my faces and heels, my superstars, is I'll order them by not how the game views them on popularity, but how I will be perceiving them on my roster. So like, oh, sorry about that. So as I was saying, like I wouldn't order them by how the game ranks them. I'd order them by how you want to perceive them, as in... Who do you want your top baby face to be? So, for example, I want Drew McIntyre to be my top baby face. He'd go at the top. And we'd order them like that. So I'd have, like, at the minute, I'd say Keith Lee, second. Then Murphy and Brian, Priest. And then I'd go Ricochet, Gaza, Seamus, Bronson, Jeff, Otis, Oni, Lutrosaurus, and R Truth. That seems like a fine order to have the baby faces in. Then I'll do the same thing for the heels over here, which they seem like they're in a perfectly fine order. But yeah, so that's basically what I do with my roster. That's how I split them up, because I turn the um, face and heel divide off in the game. Because I find it too limiting, really. Like, you can have baby face versus baby face matches that don't completely bomb. Heels versus heels, I get a little bit more. That they would bomb and yeah but still i i just like booking with usually would do a face and heel anyway because i think faces and heels no matter what some people tell you are still important to have around but they can integrate better than the game like just to think they can so i turn the divide off and then keep a mental note of them down here and that's easy to notice, like you've got your top faces, you can see who's been booked, who's not been booked, etc, etc. And I did the same with the women over here, I've got my top face of women, top heel women, like that, ordered in that regard. I've got my part-timers, Edge and Christian over here, Cena and Brock. Tag teams have done the same thing, that's actually what this section is down here, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> Um, these are the babyface tag teams, these are the heel tag teams, these are the babyface women tag teams, these are the heel baby heel women tag teams, these are just leftovers. 
<laughs> um, manages. Dio Madden, like he does wrestle, so is MVP Robert Stone and Zelina. They all wrestle, but I've got them in a manager's section just to keep an easy note because they are, that is what they primarily are, is managers or muscle in Dio's case. And then I've got the general manager, which is Eve. So that's my raw roster page breakdown of how I would book like a raw show. And then SmackDown, I've got the same thing over here. And there's actually fairly update as well, because I can see Tony Nish is on the babyface side. Um, I can actually move Riddick Moss just here now. So yeah, I've got the top faces, top heels, face tag teams, heel tag teams, and then um, Omos, Rezar, and Tucker. I actually could do like Dio Madden, or I put him over here, but they wrestle, so they're kind of just like not really singles heels or tag heels so they've got their own little subsection down here of just like muscle enforcers they are all effectively the same person in my game so it's fine then face women heal women face women teams heal women teams um face tag teams heal tag teams managers bivens and then the general manager is adam pierce and that's my roster breakdown so then if i had yeah I've just done my roster if I was to go on the roster, like, is it, if you book how you perceive the women, not women, I'll just say that because I only have the women up, how you perceive the people, um, the game will eventually learn, because, say I wanted to book Bo Dallas as a main event star, um, he's got 36, so hypothetically he would be at the bottom of my, like, roster list I just went over, because he's got 36 popularity. And, yeah, but if I wanted to perceive him as my top heel, and I put him at the top of the list, I've just realised that this may be cut off a little bit, because, um, the way I record, I'm only recording the TW screen, so I'll just drag it across a little bit so you can see it all properly. There we go, yeah. So, yeah. If I, if I put Bo Dallas up here instead of Bray Wyatt and I booked him like that, eventually the game would learn and he would get the popularity up. So it does sort of all work itself out in the end. Like, for example, Adam Cole has less popularity than Bobby Lashley, Andrade, Miz, Morrison, Strowman, etc. But because I'm perceiving him at this level, eventually he is getting up to that level already and he will be at that level and it will all sort of even out. So it's fine. So that's the roster pages, and that's my spreadsheet. But the other page on the spreadsheet, I've got a pay-per-views tab, and I've got a pay-per-views for season one or two tab. I probably will just black that bit out there a minute ago because there were spoilers on there. And I don't want to show you them yet. So I'll make a new one. Hypothetically, right, let's book. Oh, I've got stables and teams first. I've been over a minute ago. But with stables and tag teams, um... One of my pet peeves in real life is breaking up of tag teams for no reason. So, I try to avoid doing that. I only break up a tag team if I've got a plan for one or both people in it. Or if it was left as a goal. <laughs> you know. Yeah, so like, I wouldn't just break up Aussie Might for the sake of breaking them up. Because Shane Fawn and Brendan Vink wouldn't do anything as solo stars, so I'm going to keep the tag team together. Putting people in tag teams, I do... If I've got mid-carders and stuff that I want to put in a decent role that don't really have anything interesting about them. For example, Tozawa and Humberto Carrillo, two people I knew I wanted to, like, not bury because they're both, like, decent little cruiserweight wrestlers. And I thought they could make a good tag team and they didn't really have anything interesting going on, so I put them in the Path of the Dragon thing and they have that going for them, so... I do like to make sure everybody has something going on at all times. Whether it be they pop up for one minute vignettes every week or they got like an actual arc. But they, 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 no one has to be on the show every single week. Like, the only person here that I don't really think has got anything going on at the minute would be James Storm, who's sort of an outlier. He had the forgotten thing, but then I sort of broke that up. Um, most of these women have stuff going on now. Um, Iconics did just float for a while, but they are just the Iconics. They just got a win on the most recent episode of Raw I just recorded. So they, they are like the lowest 
but everyone, all of these have got stuff going on. Pretty much everybody over here has got stuff going on. And they don't have to be on the show every week because there's not enough room, even on a three hour Raw. But just make sure they've got something to do. I don't like having people that just float about on SmackDown. Um, I think Neeson Moss, which was a forced breakup by the game on the random um, storyline thing, which I've got to do another one ahead of the next month, which is going to be annoying. Um, Jinder's not really doing much. And then everyone else over here is doing stuff as well. Not to make sure everyone's got stuff to do. And then if that if that thing is put them in a tag team, for example, um, I could do with another babyface tag team on Raw because I really stacked the tag division heavily on the SmackDown side. If I had two babyfaces here, say Jeff Hardy and Oni weren't doing anything, they could be put in a team, but those two don't really seem like a tag team at the minute. Or ever. <laughs> Stables is the same thing. Um, a lot of people in real life are criticizing um, AEW right now because they just seem to be making stables for the sake of it and not really giving them a backstory and just they just exist to get more people on the show. And while I think putting a um, group of people around like a top guy will help them grow, for example, look at Damian Priest and Buddy Murphy and Johnny Gargano on my game, um, stables for the most part I like to make sure why is this stable a thing why is this group of people together what is their aim Sasha she's got her insurance policy they they existed to start with to keep the belt on Sasha and now they exist to calculatively get it back with their new statistician Dana Brooke Bivens Enterprises was a group of like people who wanted to align with Bivens and keep him in power because he was doing them a service in power and Pierce was being um disrespectful to them and sort of like being against them and then when Bivens got kicked out of power he still has them around because well he earned their trust and they're all they all want him to stick together because they feel like the system is out to get them stuff like that death from above isn't really a faction i just in here because they're a manager into a tag team jflow exists just to bring the fun and bring their interesting genre of music to the world of wrestling it can be something as silly as that like they exist because they want to have fun and sing and dance Mean Girls again similar to Death and Above isn't really a faction it's Carmella, D Danny Jordan with their manager A-List was a ragtag gaggle of misfits in the Robert Stone brand and the Miz and Morrison were a tag team and they wanted protection against J-Flo in numbers and then they bought out the Robert Stone brand. So now they all exist just to talk, sort of cover each other's back. And just rely on each other, really. Hurt Business exists because MVP wants to try and save the career of Lashley, Shelton, Cedric and Dio. Because like in real life, that's the same reason the Hurt Business existed. They were kind of Lashley's insurance policy. But it was more so just MVP. He wanted to save the careers of some people. The message, well, we all know why they exist. They're the most obvious group I've got. They make their uh, their message, no pun intended, abundantly clear as to why they are a thing that exists. Purge just sort of exists to bring chaos to Raw. They just attack whoever they feel has done Alistair Black dirty throughout the years. And with Alexa now on their side, maybe even women who have done them a disservice. And they can get away with it because they're the Purge. Undisputed Era group of old indie friends looking to shock the system of the WWE etc like, like what the real Undisputed Era was doing nothing really new there the way was Gargano's off branch of the church when they sort of all turned against Seth Rollins and now it's devolved into his most loyal servants and his wife just to watch his back really Vega again basically similar to the Hurt Business she brought these people together to try and Originally, they bought she bought Escobar and Scott in to try and get Andrade the title, but then once that failed, they did she did just keep them around, sort of like for the same reason the Hurt Business exists, just to try and save the floundering careers. But not only really floundering, but to get off the ground the careers of some young hot stars. So, I would avoid making factions just for the sake of it. Um, it's definitely a trap that I I get because I fall into it a lot. 
but try to avoid um, booking factions just for the sake of booking factions. Um, pay-per-views, um, I do mine every month, and I'm getting into trying to get out of the habit of, I definitely fell into, of the feuds for the pay-per-view, say we've got f- Great Balls of Fire week 4 July, I would plan the card out for that show and then I would start week four of July week one of July would be when the feud would start and then that was they would lead up to the pay per view. That is something I'm trying to get out of because I don't I think that like sort of pigeonholes you. As you can see from I feel like the start of season three already. McIntyre and Lashley, they started their feud on week three of April. They weren't on backlash, they weren't on money in the bank. Whereas if this was last year I probably would have just started the Lashley McIntyre feud week one of June because they if they were gonna be on the next pay-per-view bad blood which they may well be spoilers <laughs> but that that is a thing like i would i would like to get out of the habit of just doing four week views and then moving on because i feel like it again it pigeonholes you and unless you plan on a feud going long which we'll get into long term in a minute then like it's really just seems like a lot of one and done and you can't really get invested in too much. So I'm trying to sort of get out of that start feuds throughout the episode because it may just be me, but like if all the feuds started on week one, I would just watch week one of Raw and SmackDown and then I would know the full card and then I would just skip to the pay-per-view because like you know what's going to be on the show. Whereas if I start feuds throughout the month, then they can continue you continue watching all the episodes stay tuned to watch like all the new stuff occurring and not all matches will be on the pay-per-views some feuds can be blown off on television is another thing that i need to sort of get into so that's 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 basically my advice is just try not to book from show to show try and like integrate it all and again it's i i it's not important to have all of your top guys on every pay-per-view drew mcintyre hasn't been on a pay-per-view since wrestlemania um, Bray Wyatt, Alistair Black haven't been on pay-per-view since WrestleMania, but they've all been doing stuff, apart from Bray, I guess. <laughs> but I, it, it basically a case of I didn't think Lashley and McIntyre was ready for a pay-per-view at Backlash, and then I didn't have room for it on Money in the Bank. So, yeah, you just keep the feuds going, they don't have to go on any pay-per-view, but then that freshens up the pay-per-view schedule if you've got, say, June, where I will do Lashley and McIntyre. But then I don't put, say, Keith Lee's a bad example because he's the champion. Buddy Murphy, if he's feuding with, like, Alistair Black, which just started on the most recent episode of Raw I've recorded at this time. And if I don't do that match on Bad Blood, I could do that at the July pay-per-view. And then it just sort of like keeps things fresh. And it extends feuds from just being four week done, four week done, four week done, unless you specifically want four weeks and then at the pay-per-view you set in motion something for the next four weeks which i did a fair bit last year as well but i will go over short-term and long-term pay-per-views for you now like short and long-term booking for example let's let's just get a documentation they've got let's do um back let's just say we've got three pay-per-views coming up. we've got backlash we've got vengeance and then we've got SummerSlam. and then i i said for example i want my wwe championship match at SummerSlam to be edge versus seth rollins i don't because i did that match at SummerSlam last year so you know this isn't just me projecting my actual booking onto you say i wanted edge versus seth to be the um SummerSlam main event for the title and then I wanted Edge was the champion. He won the say he won the belt at WrestleMania. So I had I'll have Edge defending the belt here and Edge defending the belt here because I like to have all the titles defending on all the pay per views. That is a thing I like to do. So I've got find two people just to put in for Edge. Or can I make it be one feud or it can be two? But we'll say Edge for example. This is this is how I book things. So for example, I've got Mania, and then I book. I, after I've done WrestleMania, I pencil in what I want the SummerSlam card to look like. Because that's the next big pay-per-view. 
So then I'd have to fill out Backlash, Vengeance, Money in the Bank, and all that, etc. to get to the SummerSlam. So let's pretend now we've got the easy way of using them, we've got SummerSlam. After Mania. Say Edge beat Randy Orton for the title at WrestleMania, so Backlash, for example, can be Edge versus Randy Orton too. And then Vengeance, you find top our top heel is not doing anything, say we'll do Kevin Owens. Edge versus Owens, and then boom, SummerSlam is Edge versus Rollins. That's short term. For example, if I wanted Edge versus Seth to be a championship match, there I can do Edge versus Randy, Edge versus Owens, and star Edge versus Seth week one of August. But long term, if I say if I wanted Edge versus Seth to be non title, and it was last year, I had the whole Church of Rollins around, but I wanted Edge on all of the pay per views. And I started the feud the night after WrestleMania. How do I fill time between WrestleMania and SummerSlam? Backlash Vengeance. Well, for starters, the first thing that comes to mind is if I started a feud of Edge and Seth the night after WrestleMania, um, and Seth Rollins had a Church of Rollins. Or, if he, if he didn't have a Church of Rollins, I could say Seth curb stomped Edge, for example, took him out to delay the match in kayfabe, and then at Backlash we can do Seth Rollins versus Christian. And then at Vengeance, Edge can come back and Seth can find a friend. And you can do Edge and Christian versus Seth and Friend. And then you're at SummerSlam and you get to do Edge versus Seth. Boom, that's long term. But also, if I'm thinking Mania to Mania, because there is occasionally times where I've got my WrestleMania plans booked in a year out from advance. Say I wanted to do WrestleMania main event. I said, for example, I know what I I plan my WrestleMania main events to be next year in the save. So, I I'm booking with those in mind. So the people that I know that are going to be involved, I'm going to keep strong throughout the year. It's always good to have penciled in um your your SummerSlam card um. As far as far out for Mania as you can, so like as soon as you finish Mania, really start working on. It hasn't got to be finalized because things evolve as you go along, but I like to have my championship matches, my other big matches involving my big people involved, penciled in, and then you can swap and change them as you build. But I like to have an idea of where I'm going with that, and then obviously. The rest of it you can fill in with stuff as you get closer to SummerSlam. So, for example, last year, I've got my heavy season 1 and 2 here. Last year's SummerSlam, I knew right away I wanted to do Drew McIntyre and AJ Styles. I knew I wanted to do Paige and Bailey. I knew I wanted to do Seth and Edge. And Roman and The Fiend. So I had those, those are the matches I had penciled in from After Mania. And then... As the series was going on, the whole thing with Daniel Bryan sort of fell into place. I knew I was going to have Braun take the belt into SummerSlam. I didn't know who he was going to defend against. And then Bryan sort of just became the guy. Yeah, but I have these all penciled in. I didn't have the whole thing penciled in. Like, I wouldn't have penciled in, oh, we're going to do Street Profits and Rey Mysterio versus Murphy, Gargano and Akam. That's a thing that sort of just evolved as the storylines progressed. But it is important to have... A penciled in, maybe some of it in hard pen in case you get an in, but then as you get an injury, you got to erase it. To of where you're going in the long term for SummerSlam and then for Mania, after SummerSlam, I pa I pencil in my WrestleMania card. I knew I watched to do these matches: Cena and Orton, Cross and Priest, not Cross and Priest, Cross and Roman, Sasha and Bianca. So I started building though with those in mind, and then yeah, so then from there it was like who's going to win the Rumbles. I picked Bianca and John Cena. And then, yeah, it's important to build from there and then keep the people that you're going to strong. But try. What I try to do is I try to plant seeds 
from as far out as I can about WrestleMania matches, but it's really hard to keep a solid feud going from September to March. Take Murphy and Seth Rollins, for example. I could have easily had Murphy turn on Seth back here in October when Seth won the title from Otis and Murphy was in here with Johnny Gargano and Seth was continued to attack him. But Seth subtly putting him down and like I knew I was going to do Seth and Murphy at Mania so I had to keep planting the seeds of Seth going to continue to put him down for when the Murphy turn happened because I didn't want the Murphy turn to happen too far out because then I wouldn't be able to hold off for Mania. So it was important to just keep it fresh in people's mind about the whole thing that was going on. So I like to book my Mania card as far out as from SummerSlam. I book from Big Four to Big Four. Well, not Big Four to Big Four, really. I book from Mania to SummerSlam and then from SummerSlam to Mania. And then the in-between, I work out the in- the kinks along the way. For example, if I was at last year's Mania and I said I wanted Drew versus oh, AJ Styles at SummerSlam, how would I get Drew there? Well, he beat Jinder, nice first offence. Then he beat Brock Lesnar in a rematch. Then he beat Andrade, and then Gaza and Andrade was an extension of the Gaza view, of the Andrade feud. But yeah, that's pretty much how I do it. I'll write out a card. I pre- once I've got my SummerSlam card penciled in, I will also pencil in the cards for the pay per views along the way. Just matches that you think, yeah, I want to get these people on the show, have them doing stuff. This feud can happen. You don't have to have the whole storyline planned out. There are matches coming up on pay-per-views in the save that I haven't even started the stories for yet, and I have no idea what I'm going to do. But it is important that you do something with them because it's fine. You've got the pay- you've card there like as far out as I can. I could just write a bunch of matches down, and then they've got no build. But then you- I realize you are building to them, so it's up to you to make them interesting. Like, for example, Drew, Drew Gulak and Chad Gable versus Miz and Morrison. House House, Dabakato and fucking Omos versus Owens and Ali. These are just matches that on paper I wouldn't have booked. But as you um get through the save and you get into storylines, things just fall into place for you. Like, I had Braun versus Roman, Fiend versus Goldberg, and this triple threat match here. This triple threat is a really good example, actually. Of me holding off stuff for as long as I could. Because it was Sammy was the champion. He beat Jeff Hardy. Then um, Cesaro beat him for the belt. And then Cesaro faced Sammy for the belt. And Shinsuke wasn't in. Oh, that was Shinsuke, actually. He faced Shinsuke for the belt and Sammy was the referee. Then the triple threat happened. And then Sammy versus Shinsuke at SummerSlam. That's a good, that's a good example of just natural progression. And being able to long-term book to SummerSlam. I hope I'm not just babbling. I hope you actually are picking up some details here. But that's basically just what I do. Is I, I write out my pay-per-view schedule. Fill out a match card for the upcoming pay-per-view. I'll have everything written in. And then pencil in stuff for SummerSlam or Mania. Depending on which one is up next. Or if you're doing AEW, I guess, between pay-per-views. I can actually go into something about that. Because I'll go into AEW in a minute. But this is specifically for WWE right now. Um... Yeah, I'll have this penned in and then penciled in, penciled in a couple of interesting views. Or if you just think of an interesting storyline you want to do, and yeah, just fill that one in as well. Like, I've got matches planned for, like, Unforgiven in this save because there's a storyline I want to play out and I can, I've can. i got a natural progression in my head. Anyway, as I was saying with AEW, I can actually get into that because I have been playing an AEW save in my spare time. So, how I book with that sort of company, where we only have four pay-per-views a year, is I have written out, like, I've got my full gear card here, and then I plan out, so for example, I just did all out. I did all out, and that ma- that was here. AW all out, 
and then that was on week one of September, and then Full Gear, I believe, is on week one of November. And, like, how am I going to get from A to B? But with something like AEW, you've only got four pay-per-views. Um, you do a lot of things on television. So I've got TV defenses penciled in here, here. I've done a lot already, but just to make sure there's television defenses kept in. So, yeah, to sort of book, again, book your pay-per-views, pencil in your card for your next pay-per-view, and then work towards getting there. But say if I was going to do Omega and Hangman at this full gear, I wouldn't have started that week two September. Kenny would have got a couple of more defenses on television before I started the full-on feud. But have Hangman, like, plant seeds and mention that he's going to be wanting to get the, the title match at full gear, but Kenny is still going to be defending against other people on television, for example. That's a good way to, like, stall it. AEW is not easier in that regard because they have um, free TV. They have, like, a lot of TV between their pay-per-views. If I was doing... Um, the old school, like, 2006-7 pay-per-view schedule with WWE, it would be the same. And I have debated changing to that. Um, that'd probably be a good time to ask that, because at the start of this series, I was thinking about changing the pay-per-view schedule and doing, like, that one, so I could do, like, longer builds to shows, less pay-per-views, more stuff on TV. And that's actually a good time to bring this up, to be fair, because that would eliminate a lot of my problems. I like doing it as I am, because I think it's just a nice, easy flow. But that was just a thing I, w I was considering doing. If I was going to have done that, like, do Raw back have Backlash in week four of May, and then they don't have a pay of view until week three of June, and then that gives me more time to build stuff and then blow stuff off on television. But the way I do my pay of views, and also that is how the real WWE pay of view schedule is. So, yeah. And I think that just about covers everything. Um, I've done my roster, I've got shown over my spreadsheet gone over the draft is just where I kept track of who was getting drafted where Raw Smackdown pay-per-views oh, also ideally I like to have um, eight matches on a like normal B show with a kickoff match like a Raw branded show or a Smackdown branded show and then for a SummerSlam and Mania 10 on each night or maybe not even each night, but you used to always like having 10 on like a joint branded pay as you like say this super show down here. 10. But with mainly being two nights, I guess 20 matches is a bit ridiculous. But yeah, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to go over. There's my spreadsheet, pay reviews, faces graded. Because you can't push everybody at the end of the day. I know it sucks, I know you want to. I'm trying my best to make sure everyone's doing stuff. But not everyone can get pushed at the same time. And I have my like my top guys I'm going to keep pushing. And then most of the mid card is like being rotated in and out. In terms of pushed and then stopped and stuff. Because it you can't push everybody. You have to um, either cut bait on some of the people that you're not going to do anything with. I know you want to keep everyone around. But if you haven't got anything for people to do, just cut bait on them replace them with new people, stuff like that, because roster turnover is, like, my main issue with the real WWE. They hold on to people, they hoard people for years, so I don't want to fall into that trap. But, yeah, just rank them. Like, because I've got Luchasaurus and only second and third bomb, that doesn't mean, like, they suck and they're going to be jobbing. I try to avoid having people job too often. Like, if I've, if I've realised that somebody I've had job, say, Tazawa and Humberto, for example, if I realise, oh, I had them lose to UE, then to the Vega Mafia, then to these two, then to them two, I will just throw them a win every now and again just to keep them credible. But I don't really have too many out-and-out -out jobbers on my roster. And that's why I like to call up, borrow developmental people from time to time just to do the job because I don't want to be... But obviously you can't just have a show full of squash matches against um, developmental people you've got to do some sort of matches between top guys against each other but just make sure they don't go too long about winning but yeah that's pretty much everything i want to go over just my this is my spreadsheet i may leave a yum draft of this template in the description if you want to download it and yeah i don't know if this is up before money in the bank if it is enjoy the pay of you when it comes up if it's not 
I hope you did enjoy the pay-per-view, and I'll see you next time for whatever episode is next after this. See you then.